16 rows, I'd appreciate it. Amen. First of all, I want to tell you, I am not Brother Dylan. He has ADHD. Hallelujah. Somebody said, uh, I, I have been diagnosed with ADHD myself, and uh, my wife wanted me to go and get medication for it, and I said, but I don't want healing. She said, what do you mean you don't want healing? I said, everybody that doesn't have ADHD lives a very boring life. <laughs> so a little touch of ADHD will help you a long way. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Why don't we stand here for just a moment? Now, this is a totally different session I'm going to be teaching, and I do want to say that Brother Dylan is one of the most inspirational men that I have ever known. And it would take a man like him to put on a conference like this one. And we thank God that the Lord gave us a Jerry Wayne Dillon. And we want to thank God that the Lord gave Brother Dillon a sister Dillon. Amen. Amen. Father, I ask you this morning to lead us and guide us and direct us. As we teach for the next few minutes, we pray, Lord, that we can teach that which is going to be good and right and profitable to us, O oh Lord, as we journey back to our towns and our cities. And Lord God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would open our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. amen. All right, turn to five men around you and say, may the blessings of God be on your life. Amen. Now, all right, one more thing before we sit down. I want you to turn to five men and shake their hand, look them square in the eye, and say, you're going to get a raise on your paycheck. You're going to get a raise on your paycheck. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to start off with a little story that happened in Denver, Colorado. There was a preacher pulled up to the curb and, and was waiting for his wife to come out of the store. And he looked across the road in a sand lot, and there was a little gang of boys there, and a, a fight had broke out. And... Uh, in the middle of that fight was this big bully. And he was beaten up on this little bitty guy. And uh, the, big, the big boy had beat him. Uh, his shirt was torn. His nose was bloody. His eyes are teared up and dust and dirt and water was pouring down his face. And uh, the uh, big guy was, was just absolutely decimating this little bitty guy. Well, the preacher thought, he said, I better, I better go and stop that. So he got out of his car and walked across the street, and uh, the big guy was on top of that little guy, and he was pounding him with his fist in his face. And uh, the preacher, everybody else was just watching the fight, and the, and the preacher reached down and just grabbed that big bully and was pulling him off of that little bitty fella that was on the bottom. His pants was torn, his shirt was ripped, his hair was messed up, his eyes was black, his nose was bloody. And the little boy reached up and grabbed that big boy and pulled him back down. And he said, he said, Mr., he said, don't stop this fight. And uh, the preacher had a hold of that big bully, and he said, son, he said, it looks to me like the fight's already over. So he, went, he pulled him off of that little boy again, and the little boy reached up and grabbed that big boy and pulled him back down on him again. He said, please, sir, you just don't understand. He said, don't stop this fight. And he said, son, he said, the fight is over. He said, no, sir. 
He said, you just don't understand. I haven't got my second win yet. And he said, beyond all common sense, he said, I just throwed the big boy back on him and turned my back and walked off and got down and, and sat down in my car and, and was regretting every moment that I let that fight continue. But he said, after about five minutes, that little boy flipped that big boy and was on top of that big boy, blood dripping off his nose, his shirt torn, his hair disheveled, his eyes black, and he was beating the pulp out of that big boy. And when he got through, he stood up, put his foot on that big boy's chest, turned and looked at that preacher, his eyes black, his nose bloody, his hair messed up, and his shirt ripped off. He said, I think some of us need to get a second wind. We need a second wind. And many of us in, in this room have taught Bible studies, and many of us have taught Bible studies for years, but we've never had a breakthrough in Bible study. Or we haven't had a breakthrough in revival. And many of us have struggled from day one and and, and we labor and we work and we listen to Brother Dylan and, and his success story. And we say, well, I haven't had that success yet. But I think sometimes if we get a little bit more instruction and a second wind, that God can give us the same thing that he gives to our neighbor. Can I have an amen? amen. I realize that I am not preaching or I'm not teaching uh, to men who have a hundred or a thousand or, or two thousand people. But I'm looking at most of us that may have storefronts. We have small congregations. Uh, we have uh, small audiences. Uh, but our desire is to build a church for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can I have an amen? amen? Now, the first thing is I, I want to refer to a passage of scripture in the book of Exodus. If you'd like to turn uh, to the book of Exodus chapter 1. Uh, we, we know the story very well of how Israel became enslaved by Egypt. They had gone to Egypt as a blessing because Joseph was going to sustain them in Egypt. But when you overstay your welcome in Egypt, you're always going to end up in bondage. And yet, they never intended to get under the hard bondage uh, that they came under. And the Bible says that, uh, that, that the Pharaoh of Egypt that knew not Joseph enslaved uh, the people. And when you are enslaved, uh, whether it be physically or mentally or emotionally, it's hard to do anything when you feel a slave mentality. You've got to understand that you are a child of God that God is on your side. Can I have an amen? amen? And that it's not always going to be like this. Amen. I like what Brother uh, Dylan taught this morning. I think sometimes we all have to man up. Can I say that right? I said we all have to man up. We're not wimps. We're... We're not sissies. We are men. Number two, we're preachers. But more than that, we are men of God. Can I have an amen? And we are where we are by choice, not by force. Now, you would not have went to your town unless you believed at one time or another that you was man enough for the task. Egypt had enslaved the people of God, and that was not where God wanted them. God wanted them in the promised land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever, but they were not in that land, and that land had been repossessed by the enemy. And so before they can go from Egypt to the promised land, three things have got to happen. Number one, they have got to have a deliverance. 
Number two, they have got to have a law. And number three, they have got to know how to worship. Three things had to happen to the Israelites in the book of Exodus before they ever entered the promised land. Now, when I started teaching Bible studies 39 years ago, uh, I stumbled along. The first Bible study I ever taught, I will never forget, uh, I, I taught one lesson and I got kicked out because I was so dogmatic. I love what Brother Dillon said about that revival when he had Peter on the Damascus Road. And... Uh, that is fantastic because you don't have to know a lot to build a church. And sometimes we know too much. Can I have an amen? amen. How many knows where the book of Acts is? Where is it? It's the fifth book of the New Testament. If you throw your Bible up in the air 1,000 times and it falls to the ground and open 1,000 times out of 1,000, it's not going to open at Acts 2.38. I promise you, I've tried it. Throw my Bible up in the air, let it land on the floor, and look, and it never opens to Acts 2.38. It's like the Baptist preacher one time, he liked to hunt and fish, and, uh, and the fish were biting on Sunday morning, so he went fishing and, and got home in time to change clothes and rush to church, but he didn't have a sermon. And he said, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? He said, I just close my eyes and pray and open my Bible, and the first scripture I see, uh, I'll preach that. And so he opened the Bible up, and it said, Judas went out and hanged himself. He said, I don't know what to preach on that, so he closed the Bible, and he opened it back up again. And it said, "What the, go and do likewise. <laughs> he closed his Bible up and he opened it back up and he said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> God hid Acts 2.38 in the Bible so that the sinner cannot accidentally find it. And I think if we would take our cue from the book of Exodus that we could have a breakthrough in Bible studies rather than just teaching fruitless Bible studies. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going through the second wind because I've taught Bible studies all over the United States. And I see people teaching Bible studies, but they're calling me and saying, I've taught Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, but I, I haven't had a breakthrough. I, I haven't been able to close the deal. I haven't been able to win anybody through Bible studies. And so what do I do to win people through Bible studies? And I tell them, I said, the first thing you got to do is you got to make sure you understand what you are doing when you teach Bible studies in a person's home. Number one, they are sinners, aren't they? They're not apostolic. They don't dress right. They don't smell right. They don't live right. And they don't go the right places. And when you teach a Bible study, you are a guest in their home. Can I have an amen to that? I'm going to let that sink in. You are a guest in their room. You are on their turf. So when I start teaching a Bible study, I know something about every family that I have ever taught. And that is uh, they are sinners, and they're sinners for a reason. They have a bondage in their life, and if they didn't have a bondage, they would already be in the truth. Can I have an amen? amen. And so when I sit down and teach them, I'm not go I am not rushed to go to Acts 2.38. I am not rushed to go to the plan of salvation. The second Bible study I taught, uh, I taught the whole lesson and got through it, and I got kicked out of that, and I was invited not to come back. And the third Bible study, I got shut down in the middle of the Bible study and was asked to leave. And the fourth Bible study I taught, I didn't get to first base. 
And so I folded my chart. I threw it in the corner of the living room, and I said, Bible studies do not work. But the truth of the matter is, we know that the Word of God does work. And if there's any corrections uh, in the Bible study, it needs to be in us, not in the Bible study. Now, I have people all the time uh, send me uh, new Bible studies uh, that they have developed. And we all started with the old search for truth chart. And then we made Exploring God's Word. And then Light for Living came out. And then uh, the four-day Bible study came out. Then the two-day Bible study came out. And now they've got it down to a 30-minute Bible study. And I asked the man that uh, put out the two-day Bible study, I said, what kind of success rate do you have? He said, we have 90% success rate. I said, how big a church did you build? And he said, well, we got up to about 70, but we're having some problems now. I said, then your two-day Bible study doesn't work, does it? And I want to know where the churches are that's been built on the 30-minute Bible study. And I'd like to know where the, the church is uh, that's been built on the four-day Bible study. The truth of the matter is uh, there's no set limit on how much time it's going to take to win a soul. But if you approach the Bible study as, as a, the teacher with the right attitude and with the knowledge uh, that you have got to res rescue this person out of bondage, So when I start teaching a Bible study, I start exactly where God starts. And where did God start? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if, if God didn't want us to start in Genesis 1 and 1, why did he put Acts 2.38, the first verse, and put the, in the beginning in Acts 2.38 place? God has a reason for everything that he does. One preacher tell me, he said, well, I, I skip the Old Testament, and I just go straight to the New Testament. And I said, well, I, I believe in the New Testament, but I think that you gotta, you're making a great mistake because a man's got to go from the old man to the new man. So he's got to walk the same step that the old man wa walked in before he can get in the new steps. Can I have an amen? Number two, I think it's very important to understand, we have got to have the right attitude about our teaching. I do not wait till the sinner repents before I get the joy of the Lord. Because, you know, really, to be quite honest with you, it's not my choice whether you go to heaven or hell. That's your choice. But God said to me, go and teach all nations. And if I can get in your home and, and be obedient to God, I'm going to get my joy from being obedient to God, not from the results of it. And if you'll go in that Bible study with a smile on your face, with your eyes open and your heart open, God will lead you to the right things to do and say in that Bible study that that person might get saved. Can I have an amen? So when I go into a Bible study, I'm not even worried about getting to Acts 2.38. Now, do I believe in Acts 2.38? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going through that. I carry a card in my pocket. I'm United Pentecostal. I believe the articles of faith. Praise God, okay? So don't walk out of here and say, I don't believe in Acts 2.38. But there's three things that's got to happen before a person is anywhere ready for Acts 2.38. And if you'll do this in Bible study, you won't have to preach so hard when they get saved uh, to get them straightened out. You can straighten them out and clean them and fillet them and catch them, praise God. So I go into a Bible study, and I know that somewhere in their life, they have a bondage uh, that they have to be delivered from. And there's more bondages besides alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. There's, there's so many different bondages that a man can have. And what is so beautiful about the Bible is the book of Genesis uh, is a book, uh, and every story in the book of Genesis uh, deals uh, with, with bondages in a person's life. 
They're not just stories. Every story in Genesis is a personal evangelistic sermon that will strike at the heart of somebody's bondage. And so when I sit down and I teach, I, I start, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The first thing I do is I, I get the person that I'm teaching uh, to start agreeing with me. And I get them in the habit. Uh, I, I've learned how to say the things that they agree with, and they get to doing this, uh, but they don't have time to do this. I don't go into the Bible study to win an argument. I don't go in a Bible study to debate. I don't go in a Bible study to make an enemy. I'm in that Bible study, first of all, I want to genuinely build a relationship with the people that I'm teaching. Can I have a witness, somebody? And so when I start in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 1, and I go through the creation story, uh, I, I keep my eyes open uh, as well as teach. Uh, I want to impart knowledge to them. I want them to learn the foundation of the Word of God so that when I get to the cross, they'll know what the cross is all about. Aren't we saved by that cross? Amen. And so as I teach, uh, I'm teaching uh, to bring uh, that bondage uh, that they have to the surface uh, so that they can deal with their bondage. But before they get to that bondage uh, and before they have to deal with that bondage, I want to put enough word in them uh, that the word can help them overcome their bondage. Uh, anybody understand what I'm trying to say here? Praise God. We expect people to deliver their own selves uh, when we're delivered by the Word, we're washed by the Word, we're cleansed by the Word, and we're saved by the Word. And so I try to put enough Word in them that when I force their bondage to the surface, uh, they can deal with it with the help of the Word of God that they've already heard. For instance, when, 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 I, when I talk about uh, the, the devil dialoguing with Eve uh, in the garden, for instance, and, and, and I teach uh, that you should never have dialogue with the devil. You either turn your back to him or you resist him, but you don't dialogue with the devil. The devil has 6,000 years of experience at deception, uh, and you can't out-debate the devil. And, and when I talk about how Eve uh, listened to the voice of the enemy... And, 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 and she gave to her husband, and he did eat, and their eyes was open, and they saw that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And I talk about the lamb that the Lord killed and, and, and pulled the bloody skins off of it and wrapped around the naked flesh of Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, and, and, and I talk about the, the, their depravity and, and the degree of sin that caused God to do that. You, you, people don't even realize that they have sinned. And so you don't call them a sinner, you call Eve a sinner. You call Adam a sinner and let them uh, make the extrapolation from Eve unto themselves. And of course when I get to Cain and Abel, that's a, that is one of the greatest evangelistic stories in the Bible. It's when Cain brought his offering to the Lord and, and Abel brought his offering and they made their approach to God. And, and, and I teach the stories just like they're related in the Bible. And I get them to read the scripture with me. And I get them in the scripture with me. And, 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 and when, when Cain brought his offering, God refused his offering, was not satisfied with his offering, did not accept his offering, but God gave him a second chance. And I talk about how we all, thank God, have a second chance. You know what? You don't ever know whether you're dealing with a stubborn uh, a demon, a, a, a stubborn bondage, a, a racial bondage, a facial bondage, a, a society bondage, a, a religious bondage. Can I have an amen? amen? And so I don't try to guess what their bondage is. I observe the person as I teach, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to discern when and what affects them. And, of course, when you leave Cain and Abel, you go to Noah and the flood, you go to violence, you go to corruption, and, and you go to people making wrong choices, 
and, and all along I, I am, I'm irritating them without being the irritant. Now, in every Bible study you teach, you are going to create a crisis if you teach the Word of God correctly. And when I say a crisis, you're going to force that man to deal with his bondage. Now, I do not teach my personal friends Bible study. I let one of our other pastors or someone else teach my personal friends Bible study. Because if they come to a crisis, you bring their bondage to the surface, and all of a sudden they've got to deal with their bondage. If they make the wrong decision, you will lose them as a friend. If they make the right decision, of course, your friendship is magnified. But as I teach the Word, and I'm, I may get all the way through the book of Genesis before I create the crisis and they have to deal with their bond. How many would like to know what the greatest single bondage in America is right now? Let me tell you the thing that you're going to have to deal with over and over again and, and that is the bondage of unforgiveness. Most of us are preachers, and here, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in your heart that you still have animosity towards that you haven't fully forgiven yet? And I think every one of us just thought of somebody that we haven't fully forgiven yet or if we have forgiven we're struggling to not bring it back up now if, if it bothers us as ministers how much more does unforgiveness bother people out there in the world that have never had anything to deal with it with somebody said amen and, and so I teach all the way through the book of Genesis and there's story after story after story now I add lessons to my Bible study. Now, in the chart, the chosen nation, there's a story, there's a picture of Joseph sold by his brethren and then Joseph cast into prison and Joseph and Temperance Pharaoh's room. That is uh, a lesson of, uh, three, is chart four of lesson three. That's just one page in that entire Bible study. But I take one, one picture off this chart and I create a whole lesson from Genesis chapter 37 to chapter 45 is the story of Joseph from the time that his father makes him a coat of many colors. He has the dreams. Uh, he's put in the pit. Uh, he's sold to Egypt. He's cast into prison. He's brought out of prison. He's made the prime minister of Egypt until his brothers come. I create a story, a scenario using uh, chapter 37 through chapter 45 and every major point I have it written out in a lesson and I give an outline to the people I teach and we go through that lesson. I will convert more people at this particular Bible study than any other Bible study I have ever taught. Why? Because unforgiveness is a horrible bondage uh, that people want to let go of and when they are given the opportunity to let go of that, they will. I asked a family one time. I was teaching them a Bible study. Uh, they both had been divorced. They had remarried. And uh, this was his second wife and her, her second husband. And they were fighting like cats and dogs with their former spouses and child support and alimony and child custody. And, and you can imagine the bitterness and the hatred that was in that room because they were both going through court case after court case, costing money after money to fight it. And, and I, here I come along, and I started off just counseling with them. I got a Bible study with them. And I couldn't do anything with them, but I kept teaching and teaching. And I got to the story of Joseph. I gave them the outlines. We went through the story. 
and, and, and I got all the way to where uh, Joseph reveals uh, himself to his brother, and his brother said, don't blame yourself, but it was God that, that sent you here to preserve life. And I asked him, I said, do you know why you're in Bible study tonight? I said, you're in Bible study because of the hell you're going through. You would have never taken a Bible study from a man of God if everything was going smooth in your life. You never become a person's pastor until you go through a crisis with them. Okay, I'm going to say that again because this is the key in starting churches and, and the building from a small church up. You've got to learn that crisis is your friend. And if you're not willing to go through a crisis with a person, you will never become their pastor. And, and that, that night when I studied, we, we taught the lesson on Joseph, uh, we bowed our heads and we prayed. And uh, little did I realize the effect that they had on them, but both of them uh, decided to release uh, their ex-spouse. And they even went to court and told the judge uh, that they were sorry for the way they had acted and, and the judge stuck it to both of them. But three months later, the judge brought them all back in and made a fair and just settlement. And now both this couple is living for God and their kids are living for God. Can I have an amen? Yeah. It's important to understand that, that if I would have went straight to Acts 2.38, I could have convinced them that Acts 2.38 is right, but they would still be bitter and they still would not have forgiveness in their life. Can I have an amen? Amen. A person has got to be delivered from their bondage, and the Word is the only thing that can do that. Quit worrying about getting to Acts 2.38 and minister to the people that you are teaching. And be genuinely concerned about them. It's not about you or even building your church. It's about the people that you're teaching and you ministering to them. I heard a phrase years ago that I've lived by, and that is, uh, don't use men to build your ministry. Use your ministry to build men. Can I have an amen? And so consequently... Before you're going to get to first base, uh, you've you got to deliver them uh, through their bond. And, and, and there's all kinds of bondages. Uh, I, I, I thank God Brother Dylan brought this up about Mississippi being the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. And thank God so much of that has changed in Mississippi. I'm telling you, God has brought us a long way, hasn't he? But I never will forget the first African-American family uh, that I taught Bible study to. I mean, I taught... Ten lessons in the book of Genesis, all the way through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. I got all the way to Acts 2.38. And I had not moved them people one iota. And uh, I, was, I had ended up, instead of teaching one African-American family, I had 12 African-American families uh, join that Bible study. And, and, and I just discerned that they was enjoying the Bible study because every, almost every week they'd bring in a new family. And, and I ended up with 12 entire families in that Bible study, and I wouldn't get to first base. And they fed me. I, Monday night was my pit stop. <laughs> you never eat like that in your entire life. And uh, so I, I got to Acts 238, and, and I, I just bore down on it and, and, and tried to convince them that, right, they were just nodding their head with me and just agreeing everything I said. And after a while, uh, Agnes Kendall raised her hand. She said, Pastor, she said, you don't have to convince us we already see it. I said, you see what? He said, you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus. you got to have the Holy Ghost. 
and, and a lot of them had already changed their ways. You can tell they were changing because they started dressing different when it came to Bible study. I mean, they looked like a bunch of holy rollers. And I said, well, why don't y'all get baptized? She said, we want to ask you one question. She said, have, have you saw what color we are? I looked around, and there was my wife sitting next to me. Here's 12 African-American families. I grabbed my wife, pulled her up. I said, my God, we got to get out of here. They got switchblade knives. They going to cut us to pieces. I said, what, what does the color of the skin have to do with all this? She said, we're black folks. She said, you pastor a white church. She said, will we be welcome in your church? I said, I've been coming here week after week after week. I've been loving on you. I've been teaching you. And I said, well, certainly you'd be welcome. And Agnes, she was the mouthpiece of the block. She said, uh, yeah, but what, what's going to happen when you die? <laughs> Are we still going to be welcome? And I said, well, first of all, my choir director is black. And I said, number two, my youth pastor is black. And their eyes got big as off of them. Hey, you, you are a white man, and you got a black youth pastor? I said, he's the best youth pastor I've ever had. And he said, your choir director is black? I said, she is. And I said, I got blacks on my trustee board. And uh, I said, I got black Sunday school teachers. I got black bus drivers. I got black bus captains. I said, for a fact, 12% of us are black. 14% of us are Hispanic. 3% are mixed race. 5% are Asian. And the, right, the rest of us are a bunch of whites. She said, we didn't know that about your church. I said, well, I'm telling you now. And that Sunday, I baptized all 12 families because the racial bondage that was there was broken. Can I have an amen? amen? It's very important to understand that if you're trying to get to Acts 2.38, you are going to make a great mistake. Acts 2.38 will come in the normal course of things. All right, I, 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 I see some cross eyes here. Amen. Well, let me just remind you that I used to have, have taught more Bible study than anybody in America, but I, my sister pastor has now surpassed me. Uh, pastor Forsythe has taught 32,000 Bible studies. He's been on my staff for 33 years. He's averaged 17 Bible studies a week for 33 years. I can tell you from experience that Act 238 will come as a natural course of events if your first desire is to minister to that family. Okay, now, let's talk about the crisis. When the crisis comes, that's where you're going to have the danger of winning them or losing them. Not everybody is going to make the right decision. Now listen carefully. Not everybody is going to make the right decision. When you deal with a person's bondage, and all of a sudden the Lord brings it to the surface, and you put eight or nine or ten weeks into them, and you realize that tonight's the night they got to make a decision, they don't come out and say, I made a decision, and I'm sorry, this in the Bible. That's not the way they do it. The crisis... You can tell the restlessness. Sometimes it's very outward and sometimes it's very inward. But you can tell by the next Bible study whether they made the right or the wrong decision. When they make the wrong decision and it starts showing up in the subsequent Bible studies, they'll lose interest in the Bible study or they'll want you to become their personal pan pastor. They love your fellowship. They love, 
for you to minister to them personally. But all of a sudden, they're not going to make a commitment to Christ, and they're not going to make a commitment to the church. They're not going to make a commitment to the kingdom of God. All, all you are now is their, their personal little pastor in their home. When I discern that they make the wrong decision, that's when, if I'm on lesson five, for the next seven weeks, I'm going to teach one hour, teach a whole lesson in one hour, and I'm going to finish the Bible study, and I'm out of there. Many times, I will find a way to shut down the Bible study as quickly as I can and, and, and go to the next person. In our, on our staff, I have people that have not learned how to do that, and they'll teach people and teach people sometimes a year and sometimes two years, but they never make any progress with the person. But that's because they, are, they don't have the courage to shut down the Bible study. They make the wrong decision. I finish the Bible study. I thank them. I keep friends with them. I keep a relationship with them because I know that in time to come, when you make a wrong decision for Christ, you're going to have a lot of crisis you can't handle. And things are going to happen, and they'll make full circle. But when they come back together, I'm teaching people right now that I taught 15 years ago that made the wrong decision. I shut the Bible, shut it down, and now they're coming back, and, it, and, and they're coming back broken with broken lives and broken families, and they want me to reteach them a Bible study. And they're very careful this time about making right decisions. Now, if you're going to have a breakthrough in teaching Bible studies, I realize that we're dealing with bivocational pastors. How many here uh, have a job outside of pastoring? Would you raise your hand? So you, you are limited with time. And because you're limited with time, you've got to make some tough choices. And either you're going to have to go all out <clears throat> to build a church or you're going to have to trickle your way into building a church. When Sister Cole and I went to Wichita, we took a church. It was an established church. We had a building, and we had 20 people. They all sat on the back four rows. Our church had gone through three splits in a six-month period of time. We owned the Guinness Book of World Records for a church having the most splits in a six-month period. All of our good people, all of our productive people were gone, and unfortunately, 95% of our tithe payers was gone. And, and, and we didn't have money to pay the note on the building. We didn't have the money to pay, turn electricity on. It was just a bad situation. So I can honestly say it was almost like starting a new church, except uh, a new church you don't start with $250,000 in debt. Okay? I had to make a decision. Was I going to get a, a job and work, or was I going to put... Do what I know I can do, and that is win souls. Let me stop right here and tell you something. Every church must have at least one soul winner in it. Okay, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but every church has got to have a soul winner. And you might as well make up your mind that if God called you to be the preacher, he's called you to be the soul winner. You're not going to build a church unless you learn how to be a soul winner. Unfortunately, many of us are not in places where we can proselyte from other churches. That's the easy way to build a church. Just get charisma and attract other saints from other churches. And you can build a church real quick, praise God. If they move in, they'll move out. And they'll always move out with somebody else with them. Okay? It's important to understand that, that every church must have one soul winner. It only takes one soul winner for a church to grow. Now, you have to ask yourself, am I a soul winner? Okay? That, I, that, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But if you come to the conclusion that you are not a soul winner, you got to ask the second question, can I become a soul winner? And the answer to that is yes, you can become a soul winner. It may require a lot of personality change. Yeah. 
it may require some personality change. Boy, y'all getting quiet on me. It may require some personality change. Who wants to go to a church where the pastor's got a chip on his shoulder? Who wants to go to a church where the pastor is more negative than you are? Who wants to be a part of a church where all they hear is problems? They got enough of them at home. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for the guy that's got a sour puss attitude. You better smile or I'll discern you. Change, we, we have to change our personality. If you are so dogmatic that you can't bend anything, I'm looking for you because you are an enemy to the kingdom. Nobody believes any stronger that you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus. You have to have the Holy Ghost. You have to speak in tongues. You have to be holy. You have to live for God. You have to pay your tithe. Then I do. But I don't believe it has to happen in five minutes. And I don't have to put a person in hell the first time I meet him because he's not baptized in the name of Jesus. You can call me a charismatic all you want to. But while I've still got charisma, you're going to be dead in the grave wondering what happened. Every one of us could change our attitude. Now, I challenge you men. For, I challenge you men, okay? I'm going to challenge you. All right? How many of you think you need an attitude change? Would you raise your hand? All right, we've got a few on us. The rest of you raising your hand because your neighbor is. Ask your wife what you need to change. Y'all are a bunch of cowards. I got a rude awake one time when I had a, a, a church meeting. And I let, I let the church how I know the cow eats the cabbage. And man, I'd done a beautiful job of blistering their hides. Got in the car, and my wife wasn't talking to me. And I said, <clears throat> we had good church tonight. She didn't say nothing. And uh, I said, uh, what did you think about the service? She didn't say anything. I said, well, did you enjoy the sermon? She said, that's the worst mess I ever heard in my life. <laughs> she said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I was embarrassed to be a member of your church. You know what? I decided I could change a little bit. And it's amazing how when I, I determine to change my attitude, to change my personality, with a lot of work, I was able to do it. I lost four Bible studies because I was so dogmatic that I thought you had to, I thought the Bible opened up in the beginning, God created Acts 2.38. But it's because of the people I run with. I said my attitude was because of the people I run with. If you run enough with the charismatics, you're going to end up charismatic. You, end, you, you run long enough with the right-wing wackos, you'll be a right-wing wacko. My daddy said when you kill the turkey, whack the right wing off and whack the left wing off and what's left in the middle is good to eat. Did 
Listen to me now. We've got to be careful who influences our life. I ain't getting off this yet. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I said you need to be careful who, who influences your life. Let me tell you something. When you come to Jackson or to, or to Madison to these conferences and you hang around the Dillon family and the Madison church, you get the feeling uh, different than when you're out there uh, 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 at home by yourself and you want to know what's that? It's the, it, the difference is your fellowship. As a small church, you have to guard your people against wackos. Trying to. Okay? We're, as a home missionary, we're all struggling. When uh, 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 we bring our people to camp meeting and, and, and you got a, a woman's got her hair pulled back and she got a bun about the size of a, a, a marble on the back of her head. She's trying so hard to be Pentecostal. And she pulls her hair back and ties it a little bitty knot back there. You can always tell how long my people live for God by how big the bun is. You can usually tell by how big the... Never mind. And we're so worried about some pastor coming and talking about how unholy our people look. Why don't you forget that and just love your people? I said, why don't you just love your people? I, I, make a, I make a deal with all of my new converts. I will not be ashamed of you if you will not be ashamed of me. They say, yeah, but you don't know what you're getting into. I said, you don't know what you're getting into. I said, because the first time I climb up on top of the pulpit and I sail off the pulpit, don't you get embarrassed at me. We're trying to build a home missions church. And, and it's easier to go from 100 to 1,000 than it is to go from zero to 100. And I think the biggest problem is the people that are around us that we fellowship with put so much pressure on that we'll run our own people off. And I'm going to tell one more story before I move on. When I went to Kansas, uh, we had become this little church on the block. And we, Kansas is a holy district, okay? Uh, we are the holiest district in UPC. If you don't believe it, ask us. <laughs> Amen. And uh, we'd go to camp meeting. We, we, I watched our district. We was having a rock and roll and revival. All of our small churches were growing. And uh, we'd go to camp meeting, and there's always four or five preachers that do all the preaching at camp meeting. And they got bigger churches. They got established congregations, and they got little cliques. And they're so holy, you can't breathe or drink water. And they get up, and, and while they have to preach their right-wing wacko messages at camp meeting, and, and these little home mission pastors that are struggling so much to fit in, and they hear all this holiness message and, 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 and you're going to go to hell for everything except drinking unsweet tea. And they go home and they feel like they got to preach that same hard line message to their church. And first thing you know, they've run off all their new people. And we had to start over every year. I thank God those days are over. I said, I thank God those days are over. Give your people a chance to grow. Love your people and don't let peer pressure destroy your congregation before you can get them established. I feel the Holy Ghost here. Every one of us is struggling to reach new people, aren't we? And every one of you know that your new converts are not perfect people, don't you? And you take them and you try to compare them uh, uh, to Gerald Mangan's church or to Jerry Wayne Dillon's church or to my church, uh, and, and your people don't measure up as much as my people measure up. We need to quit measuring each other by each other. You need to let your people grow.
Can I have an amen? amen? All right, be seated. Praise God. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to teach and impart the Word of God, just like the stories talk about, until you bring them to a crisis or you bring them to a place where they have to make a decision. Now, what you do not realize is that you are the Bible evangelist. Now, they call you home missionaries, North American missionaries. But the truth of the matter is, the man that takes a Bible study chart and sits in a home and tries to reach the unevangelized is a Bible evangelist. What we call evangelists are not evangelists at all. They are traveling ministries. Now, if they teach Bible studies, I'll call them an evangelist too. But you are the true Bible evangelist. So you need to accept your calling as a home missionary that you are a Bible evangelist. And it's much easier to convert someone that's 18 inches from your face uh, instead of 100 feet on the back row. And it's much easier to convert somebody one-on-one -on -one than it is a sinner on the back row that's hid among the stuff. Before I move on, I'm going to ask you, how do you get Bible studies? Everywhere you go, you should major on meeting people. You ought to me. Surely you go to the grocery store and buy groceries. And if you're a creature of habit, you go to the same checkout stand. And usually the same lady that checks you out, she checks you out every time. Have you gotten acquainted with her? The guy that pumps your gasoline, or the, where you buy your gasoline. Surely you go into the convenience stores. But if you're in such a big hurry, you ain't got time to meet the person behind the counter. They need to get to know who you are. Surely you go to a dentist. I've taught my dentist Bible study. I baptized my dentist in Jesus' name. I taught my car dealer a Bible study. He overcharged me for my car. And I figured the best way to get it back is make you start paying tithe. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I've won some of my children's school teachers to God. Amen. We won a mortician not too long ago. And somebody said, that Cornwell trying to get a discount on everything. <laughs> But you deal with morticians. You deal with the laundry. You deal with the grocery store. You deal with, with the service stations. You deal with convenience stores. You deal with people every day. But sometimes we got to stop and realize that God might be wanting to give us a Bible study if we can build a relationship with some of these people. The car dealer I was talking about, I, I went to his office almost every week and talked to him every week for two years before I got to first base with the Bible study. But when he had a crisis in his life, and, the, and two years later, he calls me and asks me for the Bible study. So you've got to make yourself available to people. Can I have an amen? amen? Now, we're bivocational. We have limited time. I was teaching about 11 Bible studies a week. I didn't have time for any more Bible studies. And I had to create ways to teach Bible studies. And so I started combining Bible studies and forming small groups. Now listen carefully, okay? I started forming small groups in people's houses. I would not let them come to church because the people I had sat on the back four rows. I didn't want my new converts sitting with them. And I didn't want the new people coming in learning why the church is split three times. I basically did not want my new people to be introduced to my old people. But I had to bring, I, I had to create, and, and so I, I started combining Bible studies. 
and uh, it would create a new night, and I'd open another Bible study. And first thing you know, I'm teaching 11 group Bible studies. I have 157 adults in 11 separate Bible studies. And I taught them for over nine months, and I wouldn't let them come to the house of God. I didn't need them to come to the house of God because I was passing the collection plate in the Bible studies. And the, and, and the 20 people sitting on the back four rows couldn't understand how I was wearing new suits and how I was driving a brand new Chevrolet with a dealer tag on it. And then I brought in a reaper, not the grim reaper, but a reaper, and we had three nights of revival. I brought them all to the house of God, and out of that 157 uh, people in my Bible studies, 137 of them got the Holy Ghost in three nights. And when I brought them to the house of God, I had reserved seats for them. And first thing you know, the people on the back four rows were sitting out in the foyer. You have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But you have to learn how to build a group Bible study. I'm going to talk about that for just a moment. How do you build a group Bible study? The first thing you do is you do not start with a group. If you start with a group, you will lose a group. Okay? A lot of us are so anxious to build a church quickly that we, we get a, a, a group Bible study and uh, none of them are converted and we teach them, and they unconvert themselves in a group. It's called group mentality. So I start with one couple. One couple. And I teach them until I bring them to their crisis. They go through the crisis and make the right decision. Now, now I call that moment conversion. Conversion. I didn't say they were saved. I called that moment conversion when now they are absolutely believing what I teach. They know I'm teaching the Word of God. They have confidence in me. They are trusting me now. And then I will either bring a couple into that Bible study or I'll ask them if they know somebody else that would like to be in this Bible study. And usually they have somebody and they'll bring in another couple, and now it's two couples against one. I'm converted, they're converted, the other couple is unconverted. So it's four converted against two unconverted. And the peer pressure is so great that it doesn't take as long to convert the second couple as it did the first couple. Question. Do I start the Bible study over? I'm glad you asked that. When I teach the Bible study, every lesson I review. When I open my Bible study, I'll ask questions about how many different time periods was in the Old Testament. And they'll say four. Who was the first man? They'll say Adam. I say, who was the first mistake? They'll say Eve. And uh, I, I, I ask how many books in the Old Testament, uh, uh, how many days it take God to create the heaven and the earth, and, they, and they'll say six. I say, uh, they'll say seven. I say, no, it takes six. What did God do on the seventh day? That's right. He went to church. And I just review every chart and every lesson every time I go to Bible study. And I just flip pages and ask questions just to see if the people have gotten it. And when they bring in a new family, I review so often that it doesn't take long to get the, old fam the new family caught up to where the old family is. And, and when they go through their crisis and they are converted, I let another family come in. And now it's three families against one. And I very carefully build those groups. And I'm in their home. 
I'm using their electricity. I'm using their janitor. I'm using their coffee pot. I'm using everything they've got. Praise God. Be very careful as a home missionary that you do not teach in your home. You teach in other people's homes. And as you teach Bible studies, uh, you'll learn which homes uh, have hospitality. And if you find a home that has great hospitality and you can convert that family, I didn't say baptize them, I didn't say get the Holy Ghost, I said convert that family and start building a group in that home. And, and in one Bible study, I had 37 adults in that Bible study. And when I baptized them, I baptized all 37 of them at one time. It didn't happen in one week, two weeks, or three weeks. I taught that Bible study over a year. But when I reaped, I reaped big. You understand? And so the, the, the key point that I'm trying to get across here, if you're going to win people, build a relationship with the people. Use the book of Genesis to teach the stories uh, that they can agree with and impart knowledge uh, and build relationship, knowing that every story is going to work on the bondage of their life. Can I have an amen? And when they're converted, what's the second step? It's called establishing the law in their life. When they are converted, I become pastor. When they are converted... I become an authority in their life. Too many of us try to become authority in their life before they go through the crisis. How many of y'all are, are still with me? Okay. When I become an authority, I didn't say a pastoral authority, I just have some influence in their life now. Then I start teaching the Word of God as if though it applies to them. And as I'm teaching the law in their life, it's amazing how they'll start making subtle changes in their life. I'll give an example. I was teaching a man and his wife a Bible study, and the, the, the conversion point was quite traumatic. And uh, it was it was. It was very traumatic. But when they got to the crisis point and I started establishing the law of the Lord, they took their TV and turned the face of it to the wall, put a towel over it, and made a coffee table out of it. And I, I wouldn't even preach on TV. But I had preached on Sodom and Gomorrah, and I would preached on Nineveh, and, and I preached on sin, and taught on evil, and they decided what they were watching on TV was evil, and it was evil. They had to turn the TV around and unplug it till they could get the, the, the cable disconnected. And then she started letting her hair grow long. And the first thing you knew, she was wearing skirts in Bible study. And by the time they came to the house of God, they were already paying their tithe. So you, you can teach the law of the Lord, but you have to wait until the people are converted before you teach the law of the Lord. The law will turn off the unconverted. Can I have an amen? amen? Anybody got anybody sitting on your pew that hadn't straightened out yet? Can I see your hand? All right. Put your hand down. Anybody have been frustrated because you can't get them straightened out in time? Okay. You need to quit being frustrated. Are they coming to the house of God? Yes. Do they like you? Yes. Amen. Work with them. I work with people until they become rebellious. Listen to me now. When they become rebellious, then they'll run somebody else off. That's when I deal with them. And I just explain that you're not fitting in here, and you'd be better someplace else. Because I'd rather remove the cancer than have it spread. Can I have it? Amen. But I promise you, before I run somebody off, I'm going to do everything I can to keep them. You build a church by bringing people in, not by running people out. 
Can I have an amen? Now, the third thing that I do is I teach them worship. Now, this is important in a small church because they got to get the Holy Ghost. And when they come forward and there's nobody to pray for them because the four rows are filled with the backsliders on the back, they're not going to help anybody else get the Holy Ghost. So you've got to have a way to help them get the Holy Ghost. And I teach worship in the home. And I have lessons that I add uh, on Psalms 148, 149, 150, and, and I teach praise and worship. I'll give you an example. I had one couple that the first time I said, uh, can you say praise the Lord? And they had the office time saying praise the Lord. They had never said pray. They, they've used a GD word, <laughs> but never praise the Lord. And so one day I went to Bible study, and God had blessed them, and they was able to get a new car. And I said, did you praise God for that car? He said, praise the Lord for that car. I said, that wasn't hard, was it? Come on, say it again. Praise the Lord for that car. Praise the Lord for that car. I said, it's getting easier, isn't it? And I said, it one more time. Praise the Lord for that car. He said, praise the Lord for that car. And we all laughed about it. But from that point on, every time something good happened, he'd praise the Lord for it. And they learned how to say hallelujah. And I taught them when I say something good, you're supposed to say amen. And, I, and, and back and forth across the table, I'm preaching and they're saying amen. I can't stand to preach somebody that doesn't say amen. I don't like people that don't know how to say amen. I don't like dead church. So when they come to the house of God, this couple came and they sat beside one of the persons from the back four rows that had moved up. And after church, they said, Pastor, we need to get them in a Bible study. <laughs> they said, I believe we could convert them. I didn't have the heart to tell them that they both been filled with the Holy Ghost 47 years ago. Make Bible study enjoyable. Make it fun. Don't make it so long that the people don't want to see you coming back. Let me stop right here for a moment. Anybody got any questions that you'd like to ask concerning soul winning or Bible studies or church growth? Uh, just give you a time to ask questions. And Yes, sir. My wife and I had a... Distinct situation happened. Maybe it's not so distinct. Uh, last couple of times we've had the Holy Ghost move and people get the Holy Ghost and baptized. Very shortly after they would come up and start asking the question about dress and hair. And literally the last time my wife and I did everything we could to avoid it because of what happened before. And it just, what's the best way to handle when they seem to come too quick with that? I do my best to delay that until we get to the Bible study. And I tell people, I said, look, I've got two lessons on those, that subject in the Bible study. I want, it, and it depends on how long I've taught the Bible study. If I've taught it quite a little bit of time, they've been converted, then I'll go ahead and I'll answer their questions. But if they haven't been converted, I'll say, I've got lessons down here that I'm going to cover that uh, in due time. Thank you. Uh, it's very important to understand that dr people aren't going to hell because they wear a miniskirt. And they're not going to hell because they smoke marijuana. They're going to hell because they're not converted. You're dealing with symptoms, not the disease. I've, ta I've taught Bible study in one week. Uh, I've taught Bible study to the ultra rich, to the down and out, to the pothead, uh, to divorce ease, uh, every situation. The one thing I know about all of them are every one of them got a bondage. Some are just different than others. And I think sometimes we're judging people by the way they dress and the way they look and what they smoke and what they drink uh, too soon. But if, I, if, if they manage to sneak into the church and get the Holy Ghost before I want them to. Let me, let me tell you something. Too many people come in the church, they get the Holy Ghost, and they get baptized, and three weeks later they're gone. That's not what we're looking for. 
And there's a reason why. It's because they weren't delivered from their bondage before they got saved. You, you get the Holy Ghost by repentance. You keep the Holy Ghost by forgiveness. Can I say that again? I said you get the Holy Ghost by repenting. But you keep the Holy Ghost by forgiving. In order to forgive, uh, there's got to be some bondage release. And, and I'd rather do it in a Bible study because when they come into the house of God and get the Holy Ghost, I'm interested in keeping them in the house of God. Okay? Does that answer your question? It all depends on how long I've taught, whether they've gone through the conversion process. If they've gone through the conversion process, I will very politely answer the questions uh, as, as, as much as I need to. But if they haven't been converted, I explain those. i got two lessons down the road. We're going to get to that in due time. Now, if they absolutely demand me to, I pull out two six-shooters and blast away. I tell people these words. I said, if God spoke to you, would you listen to God? Because many times we think what we say is the, and we know that we're preaching the truth, but the thing is, if, you, if they do what, they do because of what you say and you die. Then their conviction just died. Is that right? If you can convince, you say, darling, if, if, if God spoke to you and told you, would you obey what God said? 100% will say. Well, if God said it. So, therefore, many times people do what they do because of what the preacher said. And they don't really have the conviction, but they only did it through obedience to what you said. That don't last. I'm sorry to tell you, that won't last. So here's what I tell them. I said, w would you give God enough time to just, to just help us in this? Would you just give us a period of time to where we could create an atmosphere for the power of God to move? So that the voice of God will speak and you will be dealt with and the Lord will talk to you. I promise you it will happen. So you've got to bring them to that knowledge that God is going to speak to you, yea or nay. Now once they understand, I don't know when he's going to do it, but he's, he's going to speak to me. And he will. Your job is to create an atmosphere in that church service to where the Spirit of God can speak. Can't steer a parked car. I said you can't steer a parked car. You gotta turn the you gotta turn the engine on before that, that thing can even do anything. A lot of people's engines they don't ever turn it on. So I'm not trying to evade the issue. I'm just trying to kind of deal with a little situation here of how do I deal with people who approach me? All right, well what, I, 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 I talk to him about this. I, I gotta let my hair grow long and I can't do this, I can't wear that, I can't you, you. what about that? Do you think God if God spoke to you, would you listen to what God said? If you will listen to what God said, that's all I'm gonna do. Because I'm afraid to tell you because if you do it because I said it and I died, then your voice of your conviction just died. But if God said it, and you'll believe, if you'll hear what God said, and you'll obey, because if, if the Lord told you, would you be ashamed? If the I've had them say, if the Lord told me I'd look the world in the face, say, I don't cut my hair, I don't wear it, I don't do this, I just, I'd live for God, I don't care, the Lord told me. I said, hello. That's what we're wanting to happen. So, you're not evading it, you're just putting the monkey on the right back. It shouldn't be on yours. Because you didn't write the book. And you're not the enforcer of it. Now here's what I tell people. How long did it take for your, your baby to quit messing its diapers? How long did it take him to learn how to walk? 
But now we want new converts are someone born, born, say born, again, just like that new baby got born to walk and eat T-bones the next day. It don't happen that way. And many of them, I got some sitting here, you probably saw some serving last night. You think I'm going to run them all? You wrong brother. And when you get, you only got eight members. Somebody got to sing. Somebody got to sing. They may not look right, but somebody got to sing. Now, 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 to every situation is going to be a different thermometer placed, okay? It's not your, not your compromiser. It's the fact that if those people know that you love them and you build that relationship, Brother Cornwell, you nailed it right. If you will love those people and build that relationship, you will find out that they'll believe what you say because they have faith in you and, and you love them into this thing. I've had people, God, have, I have dealt with them. <laughs> have you ever felt like doing that? Raise your hand. Yeah, you have. But in your patience, possess your soul. You've got to be patient with people. You've got to love them. And they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. Amen. And you've got to... You've got to let those, give those people time. Amen. One home missionary told me that. I, that's where I got it from. I ain't got but eight. Somebody got to sing. And I can't. So, maybe that helped you. Okay? Just, you, you, it's not that you're putting it off. It's the fact is, I'm not God. And my word is not infallible. But his word is. And would you let the Lord speak to you? And if he tells you, it's forever settled. It's over. If God says it's not a question mark, it's a period. Okay. Praise God. And I'm going to tell you something. He put me through it too. When I tell you put me through it, he wore me out. But I loved him and kept feeding him. I loved him and just kept loving on him. And when he got married to the girl he married to, she straightened him out. The uh, last three received the Holy Ghost in our living room. Uh, they, we did tell them, yes, listen to God. Did you hear from God? They said, is it in the word of God? And we were put on this. My wife and I wanted to do everything we could to avoid it from the catastrophe before. Yes, we were pretty forced to get right into the Word and show them, well, this is, this is the Word. This is not Pastor August. This is the Word. Are you okay with it? Well, it became another catastrophe. Two days later, I don't know who they spoke to or what they went online or whatever, but we were absolutely, they didn't want anything to do with us, and we did all we could to love them. So what do you do in that situation? To, you know, Try to keep the line of communication open. That's all you can do. You just have to tell them that I'm here for you and, and that I'm here for you, that we love you very much and that we're praying for you and asking God to, to move in your life. But you, you have, to, have to understand that their casualty is a long way and that there'll be a, a point in time that a natural body has to go to the bathroom. Flush. And everybody needs a good bowel movement every once in a while. I, I, I know this is plain, this is blunt. But you deal with a waste sometimes that just ain't going to do nothing. Everybody say flush. flush. I hate to tell you that, but that's just a natural process. Because if you don't, it will kill you. Let's clap.
Brother Cornwell, how many, how many enjoyed what he had to say? I said, let me tell you, it's revelation. What he spoke was revelation. You hear me? You need to carry this home with you, and I'm going to have him pray for you. Pray for all of us. Uh, I have two sets of DVDs. One in which I am teaching a young couple a Bible study under a real life circumstances. And then I redone the, the Bible study uh, and I added uh, about eight new lessons to it. Uh, made it. Instead of 12 lessons, I made it into 20 lessons. If, if you do not have a copy of one of these DVDs, I would send them to you free of charge if I had your address. Okay, so I have a notebook up here. Uh, and uh, if you would just simply put your name and address legibly so I can read it or my secretary can read it, we will be glad to send you a set of DVDs of me actually teaching the Bible study. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I have one set that I'm teaching a young couple. They are converted. They get baptized, get the Holy Ghost on the tape. The other one is I, I do a stand-up version of the Bible study in 20 lessons. And by the way, I baptize 11 uh, at the end of that series of lessons also. Uh, but I'll be glad to share these with you free of charge. If you do not have them, if I get your name, address uh, on it, and tell me which set of DVDs you want, we'll send them to you uh, very quickly. Amen. God bless you. Would you like to stand with me, please? Amen. Father, I pray today for each one of these missionary families. I pray that we could accept our call as being a Bible evangelist. I pray the blessings of God upon their church, upon their ministry, upon their families, and upon their lives. And Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would give them a breakthrough revival in 2014, 2015 in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you.